Okay, we're live. Awesome. Calling the meeting to order at 6.06 p.m. Candace, can I get a roll call? Good evening, everyone. Mr. Ocampo? Ms. Cole? I am here. I was muted. <laughs> Mr. Murphy? Here. Ms. Lahano? Ms. Nathan? Ms. Hua? Mr. Lee? Here. Mr. Ojapinti? Here. <laughs> Mrs. Ingarrett? Here. Ms. Tejada? Here. Ms. Salahuddin? I'm here, thank you. Um, it's a work study. We normally don't do the pledge unless somebody's feeling extra patriotic. I'm willing to go ahead and just pass it up. Uh, unless there's any changes to the agenda, I'll turn it over to Dr. Delaria if there are any changes. There are no changes to the agenda. Awesome. So can I get a motion to approve? So I'm moved. Ha ha and be. Second. Second. Third. <laughs> Uh, okay, just 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 uh, choose your own adventure there, Candace. Uh, can I get a motion? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next item is the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve consent? Move to approve consent. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, do we have any um, cards for public or anyone that wants to do public comments? No public comments for tonight. Yay. Okay, moving on now to our discussion items and um, education services. Uh, so the first item on the agenda is the LCAP, but um, we're not going to have a deep dive in the LCAP at this time because um, it's the, the, the date has been pushed back. Um, so that's still being worked on. Um, so I'm, girl, go ahead, somebody talking, no? Okay, so um, I, I was going to throw it out to the board. Uh, the students and um, advisory members and trustees are here to just talk a little bit about some of the items that they would like to see incorporated into the L upcoming LCAP. So I was thinking we could let them speak first in case they needed to hop off for any reason. And then we can go into the presentation that uh, Kareen provided us that is kind of more of a deeper dive of, of, of different items that we asked for and a look at uh, what's happening with uh, the COVID issue crisis on top of education. So that worked for everybody. Cool, so Amanda, I'm gonna turn it over to you and in your group to go ahead and just share a little bit first. All right, so we had that document that we put all of our things on from our last meeting of just different feedbacks. So I don't know if Tiana and Joe, you wanna help kind of go through that list of things. We didn't really have that too many specific suggestions, but we do have a bit of feedback for some different difficulties that people have. So what do you guys think, Joe and Tiana? How do you wanna go through um, that? I don't have the document in front of me, but I do know there was some very specific curriculum stuff that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, then why don't you go ahead and say that and then maybe Joe and I can go over the document. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. So I can help you with that. Oh, so so we good? Good. Okay. Um, so one of the biggest things that I've seen, or at least at Terra Nova, that was a really big issue, was the discrepancy between classes, like specific classes that were supposed to be the same class. Like that there would be, a, say, Math Course 3, that was doing one thing, but then the kids in that class were learning something different from kids in another math course three class just taught by a different teacher. So I think that it's like, it would be really helpful if there was just like a standardized curriculum for those classes. So that way those kids would be able to collaborate more and get help from each other. And also just to kind of even it across the board um, with like the grading system, because I know like each teacher kind of does things differently, but there are some teachers that offer like a ton of extra credit and then some that offer like none. And I feel like when there's the same kind of classes, then that isn't really fair to the students to have such a diverse 
um, kind of like standard for them. Uh, so I think like addressing that would be really helpful. Thank you. That's all great. All right, can I ask Amanda a question? Or, or Tiana, actually Tiana, Joe, any of the students? Can you speak at all to the consistency in terms of contact time with teachers? Do you mean like like during the shelter in place or like before COVID started? Um, I think that I have a real interest in hearing about the distance learning because we're going to be in some form of distance learning for a while. Mm -hmm. To hear more about consistency in terms of teacher student engagement and connecting. Yeah, so I think that at least for me with my teachers, there was a really big discrepancy that um, like with a couple of my teachers, it was really great. They had lectures um, with the at home learning schedule during those specific time slots and that that was really helpful for me to have a schedule that I just knew, okay, I'm going to have AP psychology from nine to 10 every Monday and Thursday, that that was just really helpful for me. But then um, I'm gonna call anyone out, but one of my other teachers, he kind of just like left us that he was like, okay, I taught you all the stuff for the AP exam. I'll post like additional materials if you need it. Just, you know, and you know, like we could email him if we needed, but that kind of resulted in me not studying as much for that class just because I wasn't as engaged with it as I was in my other classes. Like I found myself studying a lot more for like my AP psychology and AP environmental science classes and not doing like anything for government or my art classes just because like we didn't meet virtually. And even though he like, like they would contact us through like Google Classroom and give us assignments like, it, I think that that just isn't anywhere close to as effective as actually having a video call where you get to see your teacher and your teacher is giving you verbal information that you need to be like actively engaged in the class that that was really, really helpful for me for those teachers that did do that. Did the students do any survey on this? It would be really helpful to have some data on this. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, yeah we, we, have, can. we haven't made one yet, but we definitely can. I think that's a great idea. We can definitely do that. Um, we had the only thing, we had a few more things to share about at home learning of like different things. And I just want to add one thing to what Tiana was saying is that I completely agree that you were definitely more focused on the classes that you actually had that connection with the teacher. and. The main takeaway from our um, advisory council meeting was that the connection was the most important thing. So the more you interacted with your teacher in the class, like the better you're off you're going to be. So I think the schedule was super helpful once that was in place. That was a great way to keep us on track. But the thing was, is like Tiana was saying, some chose to have class and some didn't. And it was kind of like the teacher's choice to say, I think, you know, I can just post some links to some information. That was good. But it was really if every teacher could have make sure that we had the class, even whether they thought, oh, maybe we can just have still posting assignments online, like the best connection was to have a class, even if it's short, it was still better to have that connection and ensure that you're actually going to be following up with that class. So I completely agree with John on that. Um, and the survey is a great idea, too. So we can definitely do that. Um, Joe and I do want to kind of go over yeah. some of the other yeah. points. Well, first, yeah, I'll get into that um, document, but kind of piggybacking off of what you just said with the connectivity. Um, that was the problem I encountered a lot was, um, you know, fortunately, my teachers were really good um, about the, um, you know, holding class or virtual class during that um, scheduled time. And, you know, all, I had all my teachers doing that. Um, so thankfully, they're all on board with that. But more of the issues that I um, encountered personally had to do with um, like follow up um, through like email and stuff, because you know I would have some teachers who I would email them with questions um, and they would get back to me within the hour. And then I would have some teachers. That would...
Joe, we lost you. Yeah. Are you? Did I lose it? You're back now. We're back? Okay. Sorry. I don't know why that happens. All right. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, just having some inconsistency with communication through email was one of the biggest challenges that I found through this. Um, yeah. Yeah, going off of what Joe's saying, that's one of the topics that came up in our uh, meeting too, and one suggestion was, I don't know if there can be, like there's different remind chats, chats. there's like the remind app. So every time you get a notification um, that like comes up, so it's easier to see if it was, um, you got something easier to respond. Cause I mean, that was something that came up too, that it's just really difficult for the communication, especially for a question too. If you have a question on math or anything, and then you're waiting to get the response, it's gonna be a while. It's not like you can just walk over at brunch or something and ask a question. So another suggestion that came up was having the office hours. Some teachers um, I heard did have the office hours and that are, those are so helpful to be able to ask those questions because you can then get those quick responses. Because sometimes I had the same experience of you have kind of one question, but the back and forth of emails kind of makes it takes like a few days just to answer a simple question. So having those office hours or some chose to after having their class period of time, they would say, okay, I'm gonna stay back for about 15 minutes. And if you have, or however long, you know, you need to, and whoever has questions, they can ask it then. Just having that extra in-person time is super helpful. So I'm not sure if that's incorporated into the amount of time that's in the schedule or whatever, but that's just really helpful to have that extra in-person time for that. And then Joe, do you have another point you wanna take from that list or I can keep going off of? Uh, you take the next one. Sorry, I'm having some computer trouble. Give me just a minute. And then once I got everything figured out, I'll hop back in and help you out. Oh, okay. sounds good. Um, some, let's see, it was hard to connect with, um, yeah, hard to connect with teachers. Then also, I mean, again, actually the next thing on the list is the internet issues. So, I mean, I'm not sure how much, I mean, either that's, you know, whether someone didn't have the thing where it just kind of pops out or it doesn't doesn't come in right away. Also along those lines is the teachers not knowing, having some tech issues, whether that was with something like the mic not working or whatever, or sometimes it's just not knowing how to use it. Like for quite a bit of that home learning, like one of my teachers didn't know how to do a shared screen. So that was difficult. One never learned how to do the shared screen. And I mean, she figured it out though. She had whiteboards going and she was writing everything down and she did a great job making it work. But, um, you know, not knowing how to do that. Also, sometimes there were um, people who interrupted the meeting or hacked the meeting and that was not good. So, um, and a lot of times they didn't know how to kick the person out of the meeting or how to set up a meeting to where you had a password or how to just those different ways to make it more secure. So I'm not sure what the ways to do that, but definitely making sure like we know how to, the different ways you can use it, also making sure it's more secure and everything. So that was a big one. Let's see, um, yeah, again, going back to the lack of lectures, like some just didn't, and that was really difficult. Another thing was like keeping up with all the work. It's a lot easier to keep up with everything when you go to your class and you're talking about everything and you kind of, you see everything on the board or you're talking with students around you. It's easy to keep up with as things go, but it's really easy to fall behind if you miss a class or something happens, then it's kind of hard to keep up what has happened. So one thing that one teacher did and all of us kind of agreed was good is having some like formal list of, or, or just a document of just everything that is going on in that class. Cause a lot of times all the emails or everything on Google Classroom can just be so much to look through when you're trying to either catch up or just figure out if you're on top of things where you're at. So having some kind of document or just some central place, maybe even on our on a website where you can just see the classes and or it's, I don't know, something where you can see by date what things are due and what things be done. Just the organization on that would be, that one one or a few teachers did, but would be great if everyone could try to have some form of that. Yeah, no, just uh, adding to that because um, what, what I found happened, or at least this is how I perceived, you know, what happened was uh, 
a lot of teachers assumed, okay, you're home now. Um, you have, you know, way more time than you would regularly. Here's, you know, more work than we would give you anyway. And then every teacher does that. And then you end up not having any extra time. Um, and that kind of, you know, really piled up fast, um, especially in the beginning when everyone was, you know, kind of still figuring it out. Um, so I think, you know, manageable workloads is another, you know, thing we have to um, check in on. Especially with that, I think keeping the students' mental health um, in mind, because I know at least for me at the beginning of quarantine, like I was not doing, okay, like I went a full like week without doing any schoolwork whatsoever, just because I was so like, couldn't get the hang of it. Um, so even though like people do kind of have the hang of the whole at home learning by now, I think that having like maybe a reduced workload, but then having the work that people do end up having be more like, like not as much. When we get swamped by so many assignments, then like it, it just feels like we just should give up because, you know, how are we ever gonna get caught up with everything? Um, so I think having it be reduced would be a lot more manageable. And, and I also think there's, you know, something that I had to deal with was I'm not really good with computers and all that. So especially in the beginning, like even if it was, you know, stupid busy work that wasn't like challenging or like um, shouldn't be time consuming, it took me a long time just because I wasn't Did, did he freeze this time? Yeah. Seems like the back of the valley is having a bit of, like the, in, the Wi-Fi goes in and out back there. So if it's so. I think so. Yeah, there you go. Can you repeat that one more time, Joe? Yeah, no, I, um, I think it should be, you know, taken into account that not all students um, are at the same level of comfort on uh you know working on stuff online because it's you know it can be easy for someone to you know jot down a few math problems or whatever but trying to do stuff online can be you know more of a challenge for some people who aren't as used to it definitely i agree and especially going back to that point it's like not everyone's going to have technology. And I know there's, you guys have done a lot to try to get that technology out to everyone. But again, then there's that issue of, you know, when you have it, then how good are we, are, how good are we at using it too? So that's also another challenge. But going back to what Tiana was saying too, about being connected with every everyone, I don't know if maybe there's a certain time within the class of whether the time is extended a little bit. And there's like, maybe at the five minutes before class or something, there's like breakout sessions and people can just kind of say hello to the different people in their class because that's definitely something a lot of times you're in with your classmates before the bell rings so you have those few minutes before class starts to actually say hello and catch up or even ask each other questions about different things about homework or you know things about the material or just things in general so maybe having a set time within the class that's maybe not even at the beginning or end because a lot of people might just not go to that but maybe there's just some point that's designated within the class or right when it begins that there's a time where you can just have some time to talk to each other might be helpful to keeping people connected, which also might make it more motivating to go when you feel more engaged that way. So I wonder if that would help. Um, another thing that was on our list is just like some teachers or just there are some classes that were more stricter on turning things in or being present in class and others were more lax on that. And we kind of talked about how the connection was really important. And I know I'm not sure how to the extent you can make things not necessarily mandatory, but some ways to still keep 
students engaged to whether maybe if they can't go to class, you still have to turn in some form of assignment. Because I think it's just once you disconnect for a certain amount of time, for whatever number of reasons, it makes it just harder to get back into that class. Like the more, the less time you have in that class, or if something happens and you spend more time away, there's just, it's less likely you're going to get back into it. So if you, even if you can't go to the class, if there can still be something where if you turn something and just to keep up with things and keep engaged in that class might be helpful with that. Also, this is- Can I ask a question? Yeah. So did, were there teachers that took attendance? Yes. Um, there okay. was, yes. Some did and some didn't. Yeah, that's another thing. I just feel like it, everything should be a lot more uniform <laughs> that um, just the like the biggest thing that I've seen like with all of this is that I feel like it should be more like how in-person school is that like what Amanda was saying with like the time before class that people would be able to say hello to each other that I think if we had more of that structure that it would feel a lot more like normal to people and kind of be like oh this is school I need to show up for class um because I, I realized that I was a lot more incentivized to go to my classes where the teacher did take role than where they didn't. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely agree. Another thing with that is kind of with the engagement, it was difficult. I'm not really sure how to solve this problem, but that might also be with the comfort of being on screen too, is that a lot of times the teacher is asking questions and you don't really get a response. And I'm not sure like what different ways you increase that engagement, maybe having more communication before class with, with your friends and just people in your class might help make people more comfortable with talking on screen. But a lot of times people would have their camera off and just be typing in the chat or not respond at all. So you might have a small class with low attendance or you might have a medium sized class or more people, but the amount of people actually engaging would make it difficult for the teacher who put this whole lesson plan together and is working super hard and you know the students are trying to stay engaged too but it just makes it really difficult when you're kind of lacking that connection you don't see people's faces and you don't see the their voices and hear their responses so i'm not sure exactly how to solve that but i think just any way you can kind of increase people feeling more engaged and comfortable with using the technology either with each other and then being in class would probably help with that or other ways um then I'm trying to think, is there anything else along with that, Joe or Tiana? Um, or I only have one more point and then. I noticed that when we were in um, AP Lit that people seemed to be more engaged because our teacher like required us to have our video cameras on. Um, and I think that actually kind of helped with us feeling like we were more together too, to just be able to see all of those familiar faces and to just kind of have it feel more like normal school. So I'm wondering if we could encourage teachers to kind of have that where they like strongly encourage students to have their video cameras on because like an argument I heard from some kids was like, oh, well, I, I look like trash today and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, if you were at school, I'd, everyone would see you anyway. So like, you know, this shouldn't be that much different um but then also like having mics on i feel like too or i know there's like some hand raising feature in zoom that people can use just to kind of make it feel more like an in-person class that we're all very used to yeah definitely i think as many little things we could do to make it more similar to the natural like learning environment even those little things kind of the more we can do to get towards that that's every bit of that helps um i just have one more thing from our list and that was just um the dual enrollment is that I, we have a lot of well we have one i think at our school and some of the other teachers do dual enrollment with skyline or another school and a lot of times i mean i know they're probably linked on the email list and everything but i think they especially my asl teacher felt a little out of the loop with what was going on or she was kind of asking me like do you know how many hours a week we're supposed to have class because at the beginning we had before we had our schedule i was having classes maybe a half hour hour class with one and then she still thought that we had to have the five hours a week required 
through the college. So we were having adjusted schedule and the communication through Skyline to them or through my school to her was um, just a little delayed. So everything that kind of came through, she was either finding out through us or she just was a little unsure or how to submit grades when ours were due earlier. So there was just like some confusion with that process. So I think just as much we can do to keep um, them like feeling in the loop and on top of it as well would be super helpful because I mean I think the dual and just another word for dual enrollment like I loved my ASL class like it's one of my favorite class I classes I hope that we continue to do that I think it is a great opportunity for students to get the double credit and I just think it's so great and I also think we need a little more promote a lot more promotion at our schools because a lot of students I talk to they I would say oh what do you have next I'm like oh I'm going to ASL and they're like we still have that I thought that was only last year or something so I think just having making sure that's um, better communicated either through our counselors or at maybe different fairs had giving them a booth or just um, when we were signing up for classes just promoting it more because everyone who's in the class usually has um, does well and the, my teacher especially was great and um, I know we've had some different struggles with um, keeping different language teachers and turnover different things so and that was a really consistent class that went really well so I think just a word for dual enrollment please keep that and expand on that because that was really great opportunity but um in terms of the other at home learning suggestions that was pretty much it from our list of our discussion but kind of the main takeaways was the connection as much as possible make it as much as um incre increasing the engagement and trying to make it as close those little things getting closer to as much as possible as the actual school day. Is there anything else, Joe and Tiana, you want to add? Well, I just wanted to, uh, um, just a last little thing about the uh, connection issues. I think it's, it's, um, it's hard because uh, like, so, so my mom's a teacher too, um, and, and she's having problems sometimes Well, she'll have you know, students emailing her um, at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night asking, you know, oh, can we do a Zoom call right now? I don't understand this math problem or whatever. And she's like, it's kind of invading her personal life a little bit. And I feel like that's a problem for a lot of teachers. Um, so I think we have to find that balance between having our teachers be super accessible, but not um, like, to an extreme degree where it's ruining their life. Yep. Um, it'll go, we'll have it go out to everyone just like we did last time, Monica. Um, so the survey, if, uh, and we could talk um, after this, Amanda, about the survey, but um, I'm thinking if you guys wanna work offline it doesn't have to be a meeting to just pull questions together that you think would be relevant and then you could email those to Rosie and Terry and myself um, and we could over review and then Terry if you want to tell Rosie to add anything to the to the survey and then you guys can send it out to students like we did last time does that sound okay with everyone yeah sounds good awesome awesome and uh, I just want to uh, thank you for your input because <laughs> My, um, my daughter went through exactly the same things that you did and um, she would attend dance class, but she didn't want her teacher to see her working out. So she would never show her face. And her teacher asked me, how's Carly doing? I never see her. So it's, it, it's a thing where I, I would have to, I would tell her it's important for you to, for your teachers to see you because they miss you. And that's something that I feel, feel like, um, you know, it because she loved being in school, and she just felt disconnected. But she still, she still did the work. But it was just, you know, I, I just being around her was hard to. I couldn't tell if she was actually doing the work or if she was on her phone with her friends, because then she's actually doing work on her phone. So, uh, <laughs> so that's you know me like, what are you doing? So shouldn't you be working? I am working. So I just want to thank you for uh, bringing up those points and getting the survey together. It's very helpful. Yeah, of course. And I also just one more thing about mm -hmm. the to face. Um, I one thing that I noticed also is in one of my classes, if there was 
a few students that the first few students who joined were someone who put their camera on, then you would see in that class there was more people that ended up having their camera on. But if mm. the first few people who joined didn't, then pretty much the whole class had their camera off. So I think just the more we kind of have that, create that norm of having the camera in face to face, I think that'll, um, that'll come. So something leading towards that. But yeah, of course. And I'm excited about the okay. survey too. Yeah, because so, well, I feel like that's, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to jump in on the survey and talk about timeline a little bit because um, believe it or not, August 10th is gonna be here in a flash. And we actually wanna have a decision before the board for approval on June 30th. And I know we have a meeting tomorrow with the return to school committee. And then we have another one two weeks from now. So it'd be really, I know it's a short timeline, but if we can get a survey done in the next um, one to two days and get it out to students so that Kareen and Monica have the data to share with the return to school committee at, for that meeting in two weeks, that would be super, super helpful. I, I worry that they're gonna, the committee will be too far down the road that by the time they get student feedback, it'll be, it, it will be challenging working that into the plan. I'd rather have that, that student data sooner. So no pressure, but if you could get it done. <laughs> No, I think that's very doable. I think we're all pretty well acquainted with Google Forms by now. So, yeah. There are whizzes on it. Oh. <laughs> Shorter is better. Yeah. Um, Joe yeah. and Tiana, if I could ask you, do you, I mean, I can ask the whole group chat, but if, I don't know if you have time later tonight or tomorrow and just Zoom real quick, because I think, I mean, we can work on it just on the document, but I feel like when we're talking, it can just be like, boom, get it done. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll be available tonight and most of the day tomorrow. Okay, I'll text you guys in because if we could just zoom and get it, that'd be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Cool. I think we should get started tonight. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions for the student advisory members and trustees before we move on and to Ms. Baca for her presentation. Yeah, actually. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, first, uh, of course, thanks for all the input. That's really helpful because um, it's different for every every teacher, every you know school. Obviously, um, all of your input is is very enlightening because I think as a teacher um, at my site, one of our biggest struggles is attendance. And so, um, yeah, students don't put their cameras on. And um, honestly, as a teacher, I don't mind. Um, I understand people, you know, need for privacy and um, just comfortability. Um, not even necessarily, uh, you know, whether it's with peers or, or teachers or just in general, um, but it, engagement is really important. And um, we want students to feel comfortable in the classroom the same way they would, you know, if it was in person. And we may not be there for a little while. We might, you know, obviously continue distance learning for um, a little while. So all this input is really helpful. Um, I would just echo that the survey, getting that in um, sooner than later, because as you know, your voice is um, as an advisory council and board members, you know, that that's valuable to us and it informs a lot of our decisions. So um, coming from the classroom to these meetings and of course on public, I'm sure a lot of people would uh, agree with you. Um, I would just um, add to that. Um, one of our, you know, considerations is uh, in terms of classroom policies, um, whether or not we mandate, um, I think students turn on their cameras. I would be careful with that too, because people live in houses, right, where they have um, it's, it's the privacy of their own home. So a lot of people do not have access to alternative environments or even necessarily want or need to share anything in their house. So um, even audio. Um, so chatting may be some kind of engagement to measure it um, on an equitable level, allowing students to, um, if they have family responsibilities or if they're working, um, to log in, like you were saying, like um, email and uh, reaching teachers after hours. I'm a teacher who, you know, I'm pretty flexible with my time. Uh, I do get a lot of student um, feedback and just contact. They'll text me after three or five o'clock. Um, I can hold later hours and I can keep up the daylight. You know, we've got a little bit later. So um, and anyways, to inform that survey, um, I would ask that we include a few questions around what works best for students and teachers and staff um, in terms of scheduling and what other means we can account for attendance um, because those are our huge factors. And um, anyways, just um, appreciating every, all the input that you all contributed and wanna acknowledge that. 
Yeah. No, I think that's great feedback because I have seen some teachers comment that you know, this format is working for students that in person wasn't working for, and they have higher engagement from some students that previously weren't engaged in classrooms. So we don't want to get rid of all the stuff that was working for those students. You know what I mean? So how can we find a happy medium so that students that are struggling are engaged, but the ones that this format is working a little better for, we keep those things. So I completely agree with you. Um, and I was thinking that even for myself, as I worked I had a full-time job in high school. And so if there were some times, like I could have got easier shifts if I could have had an option to zoom into certain classes, you know, I could have done it during my break. So what can we, you know, what can we keep um, that fits better into certain student schedules while still being engaged and all that? I completely agree. Yeah, yeah, those are good points. Um, any other comments or points? Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, and Joe, thank you for bringing up the fact that we we make assumptions that students are going to be computer savvy, and the fact that you shared that that you weren't, and that there's probably many others like you who have struggled with you know you know whether it's a a, a spreadsheet or or a word document anything like that those are important things for us to know because it's real easy for us to assume that hey you know you're young people you guys can you're you're tech savvy etc but there's some, some basic skills that everybody needs to have to be able to be successful. So thank you for that reminder. Completely agree, good point. And Zoom is like new for all of us, right? I mean, even if you are computer savvy, like who, who was on Zoom or really heard of Zoom before all of this started? So absolutely agree. Yes, Mr. Uh, Dr. Loria. I was answering your question. I, I heard of Zoom before. Oh, okay, look at you. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna need a like a Zoom mask. So, um, <laughs> Zoom. Well, I was uh, gonna say I still have issues. So challenge every day. So I, <laughs> I applaud all the young people still are adapting quickly and mm -hmm. so fast to the technology. Whereas I don't think at your age I was still like what, I, spreadsheet. Trust me, I still need help on with Excel. So. I commend right. you all. <laughs> yeah, it's students and our sure. teachers and staff that all had to like transition yes. really quickly. Yes. So, um, okay, anything else? Oh, all right, I will turn it over to Ms. Baca to jump into our uh, data review. Good evening, President Salahuddin. Good evening, members of the board. Um, tonight, I will be sharing information on some data. Um, so I will be sharing my screen right now. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, write something on the chat because I don't know if I'll be able to see your faces when I share my screen. So let me share my screen. All right, so um, given the uncertainties of COVID-19 and its impact on um, meaningfully engaging our stakeholders, an executive order was established, it's N56-20. And this executive order basically extended the deadline for the LCAP from the um, July 1st, 2020 deadline to December 15, 2020. And why December 15? It's because it is the same date when the first interim budget report is due. And I don't know if you remember, there was a new template that we're supposed to be using for this year's LCAP um, that was adopted on in January 2020. Um, that has been waived too. So we will not be using that template for the LCAP that is due on December 15th. So in fact, there is another new template that I, um, I don't, nobody knows what it looks like yet. It's supposed to be posted sometime in the late summer. So that's a template for um, the annual update as well. So again, we don't know what that will look like. And that is now due in December, on December 15th. 
So same thing with the, um, in the executive order, it also asks us to complete a written report that needs to be adopted by the board um, along in conjunction with its budget. So it is called a COVID written report. And it basically asks us to um, illustrate some of um, the responses that we've made in response to COVID and the major impacts it had on um, our families. So let me actually share that document really quickly. Share. And so the document will look like this. And it asks um, just five questions. And um, the thing with this report is that there is a 300 character limit to each of the questions. So we can't, you know, write a whole thesis on it. So it's a 300 um, character limit. So um, the first question is provide an overview explaining the changes to program offerings that the LEA has made in response to school closures to address the COVID-19 emergency and the major impacts of the closures on students and families. And basically what I had done is just explain our three phases of at-home learning um, that included a schedule, um, some are synchronous and some are asynchronous. It also asks us to provide a description on how we're meeting the needs of our English learners, foster youth and low income students. And so we look at the areas of curriculum and instruction, access to technology and engaging families. The third question says, um, asks us to provide a description of the steps that have been taken by the LA, the LEA to continue delivering high quality distance learning opportunities. And the other question is about provide a description of the steps that have been taken by the LEA to provide school meals while maintaining social distancing practices. And so Tina had written the response to that. And then lastly, provide a description um, about um, basically for preschool, which we do not have. So um, that um, I shared this document with you over email this weekend. And this document will also be presented to you during um, our budget adoption. So um, I'm going to stop here for now because I know that there are questions. Um, so LEA, sorry, Carla, um, LEA is Local Education Agency, which is another term for district. Okay. Any other questions about the COVID written report? Okay. okay, so let me go through the presentation now. Can everyone see my report right now? So the objective for tonight's um, presentation is just to review various data sources to help prioritize our LCAP actions and services. And again, feel free to let me know if you have any questions and I'll stop at um, some points also to ask questions. So some of the, um, the topics that we'll be covering tonight are the grades during at-home learning, and these are just for our 12th grade students. Um, the graduation rate of class of 2020, and again, this is for our current students right now. Both of the data from um, these metrics are hot off the press. It just came out last week, and so there are still tweaks being made um, at the school site level. So this is not final. So this is just preliminary look on what this looks like right now. Um, we'll also be looking at the SAT and PSAT scores of the students that took it in October of 2019. And so that's grades nine through 12. And then finally, some more information about National Student Clearinghouse. So grades. Um, again, unfortunately, I do not have the grades yet for grades 9 through 11 because they will not be finalized until May um, 29. 
So I only have grades available for seniors this semester during AHL. And again, there are still some tweaks being made because you may see some um, little, you know, concerning data um, later on. So with the grades, I'll be showing the breakdown of the grades um, based on the current adopted um, grading system of A, B, C, pass or no mark. Um, I'll also compare, um, I will look at the grades that were um, given during the second progress report and then compare that with the final grades that the students receive and figure out whether students increase their grades, maintain, or some of them decrease, which they're not supposed to in the ones that did not, in the ones that receive a no mark. And again, as a reminder, part of our grading policy is that students were not supposed to receive a grade lower than the grade that they received during the second progress report. So we will look at some data in a little bit. But before that, so I just wanna give a context that we are looking just at the 12th grade students um, this year. So if we look at this, um, I just want to point out that for English learners, we have 12% of our seniors are classified as English learners. And this is their race and ethnicity breakdown. Um, so Native American is 0.10, African American 1%, and there are nine students. There are 80 um, students classified as identify themselves as Chinese, which is 8%. Filipino is 30%. Um, and let's see. I will skip the Hispanic for now because my slide is not showing. Other Asian, 46, which is 5%. Samoan Pacific Islander, 9, which is 0.5%. Two or more, 10%. Um, white, 15%, and declined to say 0.67. And Hispanic is 29%. So I want us to get that perspective because we will be looking at some demographic information in a little bit. Okay, so here is the summary of the 12 grade marks in um, the semester. So we're just gonna focus on um, district wide. It's there's 5,666 and that means it's 5,666 grades. So it's not the number of students, but the number of grades the student received. So typically a student would have six grades uh, because they have six classes, but some of them have seven classes, so they will have seven grades and some of them do have less than six classes, but typically it's about six marks per student. So if we look at this distribution, as you can see, um, about 50% of our students um, receive um, A's in their classes, 22% receive B's, 13% received C's, 12% received a pass, and 1% received a no mark, and 1% D and F. Um, just by looking at the no mark right now, I kind of expected that, you know, as far as our grading policy, that only under very special circumstances that students would receive um, a no mark. So I kind of expected it would be around 1%. Um, but I know that that 1% of DNF is something that we are looking at right now. Um, I will be sending the list to the principals because DNF is not part of um, our grading policy. In the next several slides, I'm actually going to break this down on who these students are that got a pass and a no mark and a D and an F. But I believe there is a question. So I'm going to stop my screen right now. Okay, thank you, Carla, for asking um, the question about Thornton. So Thornton, I will um, have to set, I will have to set, send it to you separately, just because right now they're still finishing their um, grading, and as you know, they have a different grading policy as far as awarding grades. So it was really, you know, it's about earning credits per um, quarter, so it's a little different. But in our next um, board meeting on June 2nd, Dr. Marenko and Carla Talka will also will actually be presenting um, information on Thornton High School. Hi. Okay, I'm share my screen again. All right.
All right, so this is a summary of the 12 mark grades. Again, what I wanted to do was to see and compare this, the grades that the students received during second progress report and what happened with the final grades. And district-wide, about 57% stay the same. There were 34% of the grades increase and 1% receive a no mark and there was an 8% decrease. And again, I'm gonna repeat it again, that decrease was not part of our um, adopted policy. So we, um, our, our principals will be receiving the list of the students that receive a decrease in grade. Okay, let's look at um, details in the decrease in grade. So um, as I mentioned, there were 5,666 grades, which is about, um, and 445 of them decreased, which is about 8%. Um, out of the 445, I looked at what happened, what grades changed. So 334 out of the 445 decreased because of plus and minuses. So for example, a student received an A plus second progress report, and then the final grade, they received an A. So um, I know that they're not supposed to go down, but as far as this looking at this data, I just focus on the grades that actually went down a level because when um, calculating GPA, an A minus and an A and an A plus still weigh the same. So again, this will be addressed, but I wanted to focus on the 92 students out of the 445 whose grades went down at least one level. So there were nine, 92 grades and where, who do those grades belong to? So there are 64 unduplicated students whose grades went down. And out of those 64 students, 23% of them are English learners. And again, when I'm looking at comparing the percent of ELs in our 12th grade class and comparing at the EL percentage of our students who receive the decrease in grade, there is um, a bit of um, disproportion. Um, same thing with Filipinos and Hispanic. And I'll answer um, your question in a little bit. And here's the details in no mark. So out of the 5,666, 81 of them received a no mark, which is 1.4%. There were 81 grades and there were 42 students that were unduplicated. And again, 31% of them were English learners and 31% um, Filipino, 36 Hispanic, and then 19% white. And if we actually look back, I believe there's about 14% students who are identified as white. And then as far as the passing grade, 682, per, or 682 grades, 11%, and this belonged to 336 unduplicated students. And if you can see too, that there is also some disproportionate percentage when it comes to the ones that um, receive the passing grade. Um, the last thing I did was I wanted to compare the students that receive an F last year. So seniors of last year, spring 2019, and the students that received a no mark this year for our seniors. And as you can see district wide, there is um, about a 2% decrease from the district to decrease 2% decrease from Jefferson, 2% from Oceana, Terra Nova stay the same, and then there's a 5% um, percent decrease of um, the number of Fs to the no marks that the students receive this semester. So with that, I want to answer some questions. I'm going to stop my screen. And the question is, is this the average grades of student received? How do you measure which students got A's or A pluses? Or Tiana, can you um, explain your question, please? Oh, it, it got answered in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions or clarification? Yeah, I got one. Um, I'm sure the data is there somewhere, but um, what I'm hoping there is other, any, is there any tracking around students with IEPs? 
or where they're included in this data? So I wasn't able to get the students with the IEP, but I can add that to um, the weekly recap. Um, in some of the other data set, I was able to um, pull that information, but not for this um, meeting. Just another question, maybe a little more, um, just larger question in general about our uh, demographics. Um, I noticed that uh, Middle Eastern um, is something the census is starting to review, um, way overdue, I think, in many people's opinions, but if we're not tracking the data, I'm wondering if we can start reflecting that, given the change in demographics in our community as well, and the long-term demographics. So right now, the way it, this is based on is what um, the state of California um, classified or identified students as, but I think what we can do, because I, you know, I, I see your point that, um, some of our students are classified are white as white or um, Arabic students. So I think we can um, even separate that. I believe in Synergy, there is um, a way to filter out whether um, a student is Arabic if they're classified as white. But when CalPADS reports it, um, as far as re state reporting goes, um, Arabic students is um, included in the white classification. Yeah, and, and thank you for, for just noting that. I mean, students can identify, obviously, they should, however they identify culturally, but um, it is a discrepancy and it's a global consensus. The census this year is beginning to address it. I saw some of that um, on the census website, so I'm sure the state is also getting ahead of it, but um, maybe just locally, so we know how to best, best serve our students and then, you know, the same way we serve all of our students in the diversity we've got, so thank you. Any other comments, questions? All right. So let me share my screen, continue. So the next date that, data that we'll be looking at is a graduation rate. And again, this is um, still preliminary because um, our counselors and administrators are working really hard. Um, there had still been missing grades um, as of um, Friday um, last week. So they are diligently working on getting this for uh, to determine who our graduates are. So um, graduation rate per diploma type. Again, we um, there was an adopted policy of which students students would qualify for the 225 credits, um, and because of COVID, the ones that are not able to um, graduate with 225 could qualify for the 130 credits. And then I also looked at the non grad and students that receive that will be receiving a certificate of completion. Again, this is just broken down by school. 88% um, of Jeff students will qualify for the 225, 3% for the 130. There are 9% non-grad and 0% um, certificate of completion. Oceana, 96% um, of the students will um, graduate with the 225 credits and the remaining students um, will be receiving a certificate of completion. Um, Terra Nova, I know that um, right now has 7% non-grad. So they had, um, when I pulled this list, there were 14 on the list, but as of about 4 p.m. today, I believe there's only um, seven students in the non-grad list because again, the teachers are still um, resolving some issues and students are also submitting some um, late work that our teachers are accepting. So with the 225 credits, 88% um, of Terra Nova students will um, meet that graduation requirement. 4% will meet the 130 credits. 7% um, non-grad certificate of completion, 1%. For Westmore, 71% with 225, 130 credits, 7%, and then 22% non-grad and zero certificate of completion. Um, just district-wide non-grad demographics, there are there were 116 students, 54% of them are male and 46% of them are female. 34% um, are English learners 
and I look at who the English learners are and most of the students are the ones that um, are newcomers and arrived after their freshman year and some of them do not have um, transfer credits when they come in, um, either because they are able to get their transfer or their transcripts, or um, some of them just was not in school. So um, some of these students will be returning to us during um, for fifth year, and some of them will be finishing during summer school. And this is the breakdown um, as far as race and ethnicity. 0% African American, 6% Chinese, 37% Filipino, 32% Hispanic, 2% other Asian, 2% Samoan, 7% two or more, 1% Vietnamese, and 14% white. And this I had broken down with um, students with IEP. So 86% of them um, do not have an IEP, while 14% of them are with disabilities. So I will. Um, stop there and see if there are any clarifying questions. Right. Karina, I have a question for you. Um, I was trying to log into DataQuest, but I, I guess I'm, I was surprised when I looked at the presentation at Westmore's graduation rate what is their typical graduation rate? That just seems really low. Their typical graduation rate is about 88, 89%. Um, so it's not, it's around where it is right now. And again, a lot of our students is, you know, it's because of our English learners who are newcomers. And the students that graduate through summer school will be included as in the data quest. So they will be classified as graduates after they take summer school and complete that. So this percentage will actually increase after summer school. Okay, so you're saying that the 10 or 11% difference is all attributed to newcomers? I Not all, but a most, but most of the students. Um, and again, this is something that COVID in general made us really examine and look at our grading policies and systems and who were failing and who were not failing. So what I am hoping that this will do is really drive a, you know, a deep conversation with our teachers and really ask why, like, why are these students failing and how can we support our students who are not being successful? Um, the, the other thing to think about is we're building our return to school plan if we're really gonna be equity minded is to build a plan that focuses on the, the least resource students, mm -hmm. you know, rather than having English learners come every other day, finding a way for them to connect with teachers every day, I think would be imperative. Yes. Um, since we were talking about this now, cause I was gonna save it towards the end, but so my question for that, since we narrowed it down that it's English language learners and it's, it's Westmore is that, not only, you know, what are, how are we not serving the students, but how are we not serving the teachers there to where they are able to serve the students? Like, what is the gap that, that we need to fill with the teachers so that they can better serve English language learner students? I know that this is a new dynamic for them because uh, most of the students were going to Jeff. And so now we've opened it up a bit more so that they get a larger block of ELL students, but you know that that is a that's an, a challenge to teach. So, what can we do to help them face that challenge? What what do they need to help better face that challenge? Um, is there anything else that we can do to help them with uh, reaching the students who are English language learners, teaching the students who are English language learners? Um, that then have we asked? That's a good point, Klima. I think go right to the source. I mean, it would be easy to see who the teachers are. And I say, we go to the teacher and say, what can we do to help you? Okay, because it was just a few years ago that the school was in a board meeting saying, we don't want anymore. You know what I mean? So right, the right, leadership right. was there. So that wasn't that long ago. So, it, you know, I don't know how much of a, it's a huge jump to 
where they were then to where they are now, but what can we do to further support them to help them get to where Jeff is in terms of their comfort level and engagement with students who are English language learners. So um, that's a really good point. And I know that Ms. Robinson and Ms. Rubin have been working really hard with our teachers, but I think you know we can do more in trying to really figure out what kind of support would they need so that we can help our students to help them you know, in this new era because it's much more difficult to reach actually right now, you know, our English learners because um, you know, for various reasons. So I think we, we really need to do a deep reflection this summer in the next few weeks and really figure something out so that we can reach out to our English learner population. But, you know, if you look at a differentiated assistance, of course, you know, students with IEP, but, you know, right behind it are, are English learners. So mm -hmm. we really need to um, provide that support. And then my other question is to the like availability of resources. Um, I know they, they leadership again had fought becoming a Title I school or the addition of resources because they didn't want to have to go through the additional paperwork. So I know that we were working to ensure that resources were directed to them that automatically go to Jeff because of their designation. Um, but are they getting equivalent amount of resources to handle their, uh, the number of students that they have that are classified as ELL? Um, like, you know, just you know, is the per pupil that we're spending on ELL at Jeff the same as we're spending at Westmore? Um, and if not, do we need to revisit their designation so that they get the additional funds? And, I, you know, without, I don't know what the burden of the paperwork and doing the additional work is, but I don't know. If that's another issue. As far as the um, supplemental funds, they do get the same per pupil allocation, but like what you're saying, Jeff does get a little extra because they are a Title I school. Um, it's something that I can have a conversation with Ms. Strickland to see if their school site council or their, you know, just campus, their Westmore, you know, is ready to um, or would be willing to be a Title I school. Um, but I know that that was a discussion a few years ago and it, it was decided that, you know, it was not worth it from their own end, but it could be, um, it could change. Awesome, thank you. Andy? Ms. Barta, do you expect from an enrollment standpoint the, that the EL population will continue to grow? I mean, you were, you, you were talking about the newcomers specifically and you know, and obviously, this particular cohort had a large number of them, which is reflected in the data. But do we anticipate that this trend will continue? Because that goes to Ms. Alhudin's point about the additional training and what you were ref reflecting on. So two years, not this year, but last year, it was probably our biggest newcomer um, enrollment ever since I've been here. Um, because of COVID, it had slowed down um, towards the spring. And again, honestly, I don't know what COVID will bring, whether it will increase or decrease depending on where we are as a nation. So it's really hard for me to say right now. Or a new administration, right? I mean, if the administration changes, then right. we probably see an increase um, because you know this administration is fun and they've been shutting down the border anytime they can, so. Rosie? I was muted, Ms. Tata. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I wanted to know, well, since we're talking about EL students, um, uh, their access to technology, do we know how many students or families did not engage during AHL? And um, I know we, we were going to reach out to these students um, and their families and possibly spoke to some of them and, and they still didn't pick up technology or so as far as engaging AHL right now is really difficult to measure because we did not require the teachers to take attendance or, you know, our students to attend some kind of synchronous meeting. Um, however, as far as the devices, so our, you know, Jake and his team had, again, not only surveyed, they also asked our site administrators 
and they'd also made a, a phone dialer, both in English and Spanish for a, you know, if they need a device and a special line was created for them. Um, the ones that, you know, that we called who had um, actually had free and reduced um, lunch application eligibility. Um, and we had several students and families said that they needed a device and we reserved it for them. And the thing is, after we said, okay, we have your device, you know, come and pick them up from the district office, we still had a handful that were not able to pick them up for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So Gina Enriquez had actually called every single one of the families and tried to, you know, do everything that they can to do some kind of outreach. So I, I believe there's less than 10 who haven't picked it up. Um, but I know that from my conversation with Ms. Robinson about maybe two weeks ago, I believe there are about like 23 students that you know they actually have not heard from at all. And that's been really, really concerning and challenging. And you know, we just don't know how to get a hold of them. Um, but you know, we try. I mean, we will continue to try to make sure that our you know students have access to these devices. Mr. Archipendi. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, just to kind of echo um, what Trustee Tahada was just mentioning. Um, I know we're reaching out to our students um, or EL students and, and newcomer international students. Um, at least in, in Oakland, I can say that it has been hard just getting in contact, um, cell phones, it's hard to keeping up with bills, um, having to choose between which bills, right? And, um, and then access, once you even get a Chromebook, say we distributed that, if they don't have uh, the bandwidth, or if they're not near, close enough to, you know, free Wi-Fi, um, it's gonna be really hard to access anything online. Um, not to mention if they have multiple family members who, uh, you know, may be needing that service. So, um, that was something that I was thinking of in terms of uh, not just Westmore, but all of our campuses and, and um, clearly looking at the numbers. I mean, 22% is high. Um, like you mentioned, a lot of the grades will change um, pending summer grades. Um, I would anticipate and hope that that's true. The other schools, um, I know for Jeff and Terranova, nine and 7% respectively, I guess, um, looking at the data and the data you presented too, like keeping track, um, of where our students with IEPs and our Yale students, and, um, and even our, our students who are struggling, who are English only, who may or may not have access to those resources, um, looking at that between now and the final grades, I'm sure we'll be watching, but um, it's something to consider there. And I think, um, like Superintendent Deloria was mentioning, um, you have to think about that going into the fall, because if this is gonna be the model we're, we're sticking with, teachers may have the expectation that students are going to be better prepared somehow because they've already done this during the spring when that might, might be less true. They might be struggling more in the fall, um, given that, you know, they're, they may be falling behind on bills. There's an eviction moratorium, but um, families in our country are still expected to somehow come up with six months of back, you know, payment on, on bills, including rent, um, come the end of the year. So I think families will be definitely making some different decisions. And, um, Maybe um, one thing we're trying to open is messaging to our students um, who are recent immigrants um, so that they understand their families can rely on us as at least the school districts um, to work at their pace. And uh, maybe serving those students and families, the ones we can get in touch with to provide that information um, and working with the information we've got can help better inform that at least going into the fall. Um, that said, I would even you know reconsider, um, encourage teachers to reconsider um, what they're looking at in terms of grading, um, just for the fact that um, this is not an experiment, you know, uh, this is just something we're all going through and, and students should expect that they have uh, some momentum going into the fall so they can return to school, feeling like they're on, on good footing, having passed the semester to the best of their ability. So um, I would encourage uh, consideration of that. Now I'm not sure where um, faculty are on that across the district, but looking at these graduation rates does raise the issue. And um, certainly while thinking about it, so, yeah. Kareen, this is Terry. Um, you don't have to do this before tomorrow. I know you're getting ready for the, the meeting tomorrow, but 
I, I want to be careful that we don't make these broad assumptions because there are many, many teachers at Westmore who are incorporating some strategies. There's a, a large number of teachers who've participated either in blended learning or constructing meeting. So I always think it's better to get um, more, I think we need to get closer to the data. So I would like you to break down of those English learn of those students who, who aren't graduating. I'd like to know the courses that are preventing them from graduation. Um, I'd actually like to know the teacher's name too, and then I'll work with Grace. Um, I, I think we will be surprised. I won't be surprised. I, I suspect there's a small number of teachers who need some help. And I don't wanna make this broad sweeping statement that Westmore teachers in general aren't equipped to handle English learners because I don't think that's true. Um, so I'd like to, when you can, if I could get it by the weekend, I think that would be really helpful. Yes, I will do that. But yeah, I do agree with you. Our teachers have done an amazing job in, you know, handling what is given with them and they're trying very, very hard. And again, like what you said, it might just be, you know, a few teachers that we really need to look at. But um, I, yeah, I can get this data for you. I actually have it on a spreadsheet already. So. Right. And, and to clarify, I don't know if anyone was making a broad sweeping statement that they don't like, you know, um, so just to put that out there, it was just more trying to look at the 22%. And when we highlight that out of the 22%, the vast majority is English language learners. I mean, I just think that sets off an alarm that we just would like focused on. And then looking at historically what has been presented to the board and what has been told to us to our face, it's just working off of that knowledge, but of course not making you know, it's not a vast, you know, broad brush, say, assumption that every teacher uh, doesn't have the ability to do it, just trying to figure out what the problem is. So thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Next part is the SAT and the PSAT. So these are the scores from um, when students took the exam, the SAT school day on October 16th. Um, but before I start, I'm sure that, you know, most of you already know that um, uh, about a week ago, the UC regions basically suspended um, the SAT as one of their um, criteria for admission and that they're developing their own um, assessment by 2025. Um, so I just wanted to um, let you know that in case you have not heard. Um, but so I will be looking at the PSAT 9, the PSAT NMSQT for the 10th graders, for the 11th graders, and for the 12th graders. So um, for the PSAT 9, the range of scores that the students can get is 240 to 1440, 1440, and this is a combination of English and in math. So for the district, the average score is 869, um, which um, surpassed the state average score. And there were 33% of the students that met both benchmarks for English and math. And meeting benchmarks, again, as a reminder, is that um, students who receive this will get at least a C or higher in their first semester course in a college credit um, course during their freshman year. So there's a 75% chance that they will get a C or above in those classes. So this is the benchmark for um, our district that met both English and math, which is 33%. For English is 62% and for math it's 36%. And then breaking it down by schools. Um, so as you can see, and you will see the trend is to that, you know, Jefferson High School has the um, lowest percentage of students that met both benchmarks and that Oceana High School um, is typically the school that met um, both benchmark with the highest percentage. This is for the PSAT for the 10th grade class, um, the benchmark the score range is from 320 to 1,520. And the district mean score is 912, which is higher again than the state's average. 
and the percent of benchmark is about 31 percent. And this is how it's broken down by each of the school sites, Jefferson, Oceana, Terra Nova, and Westmore. And again, there is a trend of um, Oceana first and Terra Nova, then Westmore, and then Jefferson High School. What I also was curious about was um, a longitudinal um, study, if you would call it, on um, the percent of students that met the benchmark when the same class took it in the ninth grade and then they took it the following grade. Did we increase or decrease the um, percent of students who met both benchmark? And so this is the class of 2022, which are our sophomores right now. So when they took the PSAT 9 last year, 44% um, met both bench, um, benchmark in ELA and in math. And then when they took it this year, only 31% met the benchmark. And you know, one of the potential reasons is that it's a, it's a different test. It got progressively harder. Um, but I just wanted to see what that would look like um, continuing on. So now PSAT uh, and MSQ for 11th grade students, um, 963 average score, again, higher than the state's average. And um, 31% who both um, met benchmarks. And this is the breakdown for the school sites. And again, um, looking at, so these are 11th grade students right now. How did they do last year? So as a reminder, last year was our first year where um, the SAT and the PSAT is given to all of our students um, during the school day. So last year, the same cohort, 35% of them um, scored 30, um, met the benchmark, 35% of them met both the English and the math benchmark, and 31% of them met the benchmark this year. And then finally, for the SAT um, 12th grade, again, the score range is from 400 to 1600. The mean score of our students is 999. And again, it still exceeds the state average. And 35% of the student met both of the benchmarks. And then longitudinally, this class actually was able to um, take, oh, sorry. Um, but this is the, um, the breakdown for each of the school sites. So again, 16% at Jeff, 50% at Oceana, 42%. Um, at Terra Nova and 41% at Westmore. And then longitudinally, um, this is the breakdown from when the class of 2020 or seniors right now took the PSAT 10 and then the PSAT when they're in 11th grade and then 35, um, sorry, the SAT um, this school year. So again, there has been a um, decrease year after year, but if I actually look back over here, um, I believe that the percentage basically in comparison to the state has actually increased for our 12th grade students as far as um, meeting the benchmark. And that is all I have right now. And I will stop my screen and clarification. Are there any questions about um, the SAT? So I know that you're strapped for time, Kareen, but it'd be really helpful if, if by fall, I'd like to see that data disaggregated. Sure. But worry about getting school open first. Other I just have a question request. I have a question in general about the SAT and if we're still going to continue to offer it or do it now that the UCs have abandoned the test. And since, you know, this, all the reasons why I wanted the UCs to abandon the test kind of apply to us as a school district for like, is the SAT a good measure of what we're actually doing if students can get you know, extra coaching, because I know I paid for coaches for my daughters when they took it. And 
So is it really reflective of what we're teaching or is it reflective for certain students, for other students who can pay to have additional coaching, additional assistance, the prep? Is it more reflective of that? Um, and also, um, does the test align with what our curriculum is or do we have to do a shift so that it, it more aligns what we're teaching more aligns with the test so they do well on the test? Um, and if any thought has been given to it to that. So I just want to make one comment. There's certainly, there are no perfect tests. I'm, I'd be really concerned about letting it go because the state tests we only give 11th grade and that's a long time to go. And we haven't been giving this test, the PSAT and SAT long enough. I would like to start using it with teachers so they can start using it as a, um, just as a way of monitoring growth over time. I mean, the math scores, I just wanna cry when I see that. But short of that, a national test like this, and like I said, I know it's not perfect, but there's nothing else. And so anything that teachers create is gonna be subject to, well, they're teacher created. So it's, it isn't something that's been normed across the country. So I'd be worried about letting it go too quickly um, unless we have something else to use in its place. Mr. Oh, yeah, I had your Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, actually, um, President Saludian, what you said is actually, the first thing I was gonna say is, is alignment, right? That's really important. Um, well, a lot of what we were talking about um, over the past few years with understanding what our students' uh, strengths and relative uh, challenges are um, in terms of AP Academy um, and identifying students um, where we could expand our enrollment in advanced classes and even just um, helping, you know, our students uh, find some uh, directions to their pathways and, and transition through high school and into post-secondary um, career and college options was um, based on using the SAT and the PSAT as um, those standards, which I, so I do agree in terms of not discontinuing it right away, but the SAT, for the same reasons that were mentioned, is a horrible standard to be using as a society. And I'm glad the UC has taken this step. Um, and, and I think we should be following in suit. And so if the, SU, the UC or the CSU, or there aren't any other comparable um, standards or uh, means to like, I guess, to, to start evolving our testing as well, um, then I think if that's what we're using and we've just started really rolling this out the past few years, um, we should continue in terms of with the aim of helping our students um, progress and advance into you know other courses, so we can identify their their strengths and where they need. But um, but yeah, I would I would ask what other you know tests we can use to start phasing in as the UC transitions. Because if we're gonna hard transition in 2025, we're setting our students up for failure again too, right? So um, I'm not sure if there's any news on that. I know this is recent news as of last week, um, but I would like to see us. Um, keep some kind of concrete pathway for our students to develop what they're doing and for us to track that. And I think, Kareen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the College Board did make a huge attempt to align um, PSAT with, with the common core that the, that the nation agreed to, knowing that every state could add a few more standards if they wanted to. Yes, that's correct. They um, supposedly align the, test with our common core state standards. And that is maybe about two years ago when they had done that. Missing year. So I just, well, actually that's what I was gonna say. So I vaguely remember taking the test a very long time ago. I shall not name how many years. <laughs> and I don't remember personally anything that was on the test that we had learned is, I mean, is is it like an apply? I mean, like, is it, how do they do? Is it like an applied? Like, so you should base, is it based on like all the things that you learn? So you can kind of like base that on this. Okay. And then I also took Kaplan too, but it, for a special student like me, it didn't help. So I, and you know, when I took it, of course, I didn't have any direction. I didn't have anybody to go to. So is it like when you take it, and obviously it's different now. Is it like, um, 
it should just be like, oh, which from what you know, then you figure it out? Or is it like what you learn at school to be applied to the test? You know, like, I guess how I would that work? If Amanda would be able to help us. Um... Oh, yes, I'm sure you can, <laughs> Amanda. <laughs> um, some of it was, I mean, it kind of ranges as Joe can probably speak to too. I mean, some of it is, <laughs> but. I never got to take it. Oh, really? I was scheduled for June and it got canceled. So I haven't taken it. Oh, right, 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 right. So yeah, I would say some of it are like the problems look pretty much exactly like what you've done. And some, a lot of it is, you know, applying what you know, but the way it looks is very different from the, t especially for like English, the type of questions you get for the English part looks very different from the type of things you would do in class, but it's the skills you learn that you apply. But, um, and then for the math, I would say the problems look very different, but most of the skills I would say I learned, there's very few, but I mean, that also depends on where you got in your classes too, because there is definitely some questions I'd be like, okay, I definitely learned this this past year, or wow, I learned this my freshman year. And so that either works to your advantage or not. And so there's that too, but I would say that for most of it, I mean, I feel like I learned most of the skills, but in the way that things are structured are definitely very different, but I feel like most of the skills are there. Do you think you learned it um, in regular common core classes, or do you think you learned it more like um, through AP classes? So I know you took a lot of, you took a lot of AP classes, so do you think you got more of that in AP or um you know, like if you were just taking the regular classes that it would have helped you too. I think most of the skills were probably just the regular Common Core classes, but maybe I would say the testing skills and would probably be more the AP classes because a lot of it is your skills with testing, how fast you read something, understand something, and then are able to apply it or how well, how fast you take tests or just those kind of test taking skills. I would say probably more from AP classes, but the content itself is probably more common core, but then again, you you need both, so. No, thank you, that's a powerful point. That's, that's a really good point, it made me think a lot. Um, and then like along that grain, we, because I get like, there's no perfect test and we need something and it does like flow. It's nice that we have a flow of 9, 10 PSAT. Um, then, do we do have to do both tests? Do we have to do the SAT and the CASP? Since we're relying, seems more on the SAT to track progress and, or do we still need to do both? Well, if it were up to me, I would get rid of CASP, but California has not been successful with that. And since we get so much money from the federal government, I don't know. But you and I have been on this for a while. I, I, I would have gotten rid of CASP a long time ago. Okay, okay. cool. And, yeah. All right. Last oh yeah, I'm sorry, Amanda. Oh yeah, I was just okay. gonna say again with kind of the PSAT or CASP, I would say feel like the SAT applied more to like what I had learned and I felt like I could better do, I feel like when I was going through the CASP there is a lot that was like, I'm not sure if this is, I feel like I have a lot of skills and I could show you that, but the types of things and the way things are structured, I just feel like SAT better represent that. The only thing that I would compliment CAS on is that there's more time and there's some things that, I mean, I feel like the SAT measures what you've learned better for what we've been taught and things, but I don't know, the time aspect of CAS, I feel like you're able to work more on things which is, is especially helpful for certain like math problems or that you feel like you know how, but it's hard under the certain time frame. That again, going back to those test taking skills also plays a big role in your um, score too. Thank right. you. Any yes. other comments? Okay, thank you Ms. Bach, I turn it back over. All right, um, the last part is about a National Student Clearinghouse. So um, a few months ago, I did present a, a general view on the percentage of students that um, matriculated into either a two-year or a four-year college. 
and the percentage. So we've tracked the class of 2018 and class of 2019. So class of 2018, 72% of them were enrolled either in a two-year or a four-year college. And then there was a slight increase for the class of 2019. So I looked at um, the demographics for the class of 2018 and class of 2019. And unfortunately for this, um, I did not have time to break it down um, in the different Asian category, only because when they give me the raw data, they clump um, Asians, um, that includes Filipino and Chinese. And so um, this will require a little more work in breaking that down. But basically, um, there is a slight increase of Asian students um, that matriculated um, in 2018 in comparison to the class of 2019. Um, there's a decrease in the African American students, increase in the Hispanic Latino, um, decrease with a two or more um, classification, and an increase in the students who are identified as white. And then I looked at the students are um, for their English language fluency for the class of 2018 and the class of 2019. And I looked at the students that were enrolled in college um, for both years. So there is an increase for English learner students um, from 3% to 4%. And there is a slight decrease for our non-English learner. And the ones that, um, it said, you know, not enrolled in college, but this actually could mean a couple of things. Um, for an individual data national student clearinghouse, a student can put a FERPA block on their application. Mm -hmm. So if they do that, we won't be able to pull um, their demographic or their student data level. And then the other um, part of it is could, it could be that they just um, they're not attending a two year or a four year college. And some of the recommendations um, is again to really review the data at the student le level, like what um, Dr. Valoria is suggesting and develop targeted interventions um, for students and then supporting our staff as well. Um, this goes with the students who receive a pass grade because again, these um, are typically the students that um, would, um, that there is some gap in what happened during AHL. So they need some kind of intervention in order to be successful um, in the next level next year. Um, and the development of the scope and sequence with essential standards and benchmark assessments. This is what um, I believe, you know, Tiana and Amanda and Joe was referring to at the beginning of the meeting is we really need to um, do a better job in monitoring and making sure that um, we are on the same page as far as our essential standards for each of the courses. Um, and then developing some benchmark assessments that go with that so that we know if the students are learning in the classroom and if they're not, we can um, develop some kind of intervention in making sure that they understand um, the skills and standards. Um, the next one is discuss in departments. Again, you know, the, the grading policy, I think this is a perfect time right now to really have that conversation with, I know, you know, with the PLC um, principles and really look at what does a grade really mean? Um, does a grade mean you've mastered a standard or a skill or does it mean that you are able to complete your homework? And so we really need to look at what um, these grading practices and policies are. And I strongly believe in building the capacity of our teachers on special assignments and instructional coaches to support um, our teaching and learning um, because our administrators can't do it all. Um, we need a, a whole team approach in supporting each other in this um, work. And then again, use our collaboration time um, wisely and make sure that we are really, you know, asking the questions for our PLC community um, principles like um, what do students need to learn? How do we know when they're learning it? What do we do for the ones that learned it? What do we do for the ones that didn't learn it? And then develop some um, mm -hmm. guidelines with that.
And that is all I have. Is there any questions, comments? I had a question on the percentage of students that are on um, the certificate track. What's the question? Uh, the percentage of students that are on, that's they're just receiving their certificate. Pull that up. Is that in here? Is it this one? Okay. So, So 22% so 22 of the students, that, like how many students in our district are not gonna receive this? Is only 4% of Oceana are on a certificated track. Yes, so um, if you really look at them, all of their students minus the 4%, which I believe is either five or six students mm -hmm. um, will be receiving their um, diploma. Okay, but but the total amount of students in special education on the certificate track is five percent for the whole district. No, for like five students, not. Um, yeah, that that's they're just my seniors. Question. These are seniors, yeah. so yeah. they are on a certificate track. Um, I can get the raw numbers. Um, so so I know, but there's three, and then okay. Oceana. I think there's either five or six. But the the percentage of our seniors on certificate track is five percent. Yes, yes. Got it. Okay, that was it. Hey, I'm sorry. Can you go back to that slide because you don't? I just want to let's get the numbers and put them in the recap. You can't add the percents like that. Okay, yes. I will do that. I have it. Um, already in a chart in an Excel okay. spreadsheet. Okay. And then the reason why I'm asking and then on special education in general is because, um, I mean, one of the things that is used against us to ding is the percentage of our students with that are in college, you know, in the college enrollment out of high, out of high school. But, you know, the school that's claiming that doesn't have any special education students really. So we don't really talk about the differentiation in our graduation rates in comparison to how many children we have in special education and of those that would have the ability to actually go to college. So our numbers may not be that far off. Like we may need to be making that distinction in when we're talking about publicizing the school is, you know, um, disaggregating that data a little bit more and making that distinction in when we market um, because they can say, well, we have 100% of our students going to college, but if, none of them are and have an IEP that's vastly different than what we're dealing with. So that was kind of how it was. So I wonder if, you know, this can be you know, something on our website, because if they look at data quest or, you know, the dashboard, it's, you know, it's kind of really hard to tell. To tell. And, and, and then, you know, other schools when they market, you don't have to look anywhere. I mean, that's part of their, tagline. I mean, they say it everywhere they go. And so I think that, you know, we don't do enough of talking about, I mean, that's even the 72% number is, is a really good number. But if you break it down even more, and it's probably better than that. And, um, you know, it'd be nice to have that information to have when I'm out talking to parents about why they should send their, their kids to us. And I was generally pretty pleased looking at that. Certainly, just if we're talking just about the graduate, not the graduation, the college matriculation information, I was generally pretty pleased with that. All things considered, you know, the um, and it's a good story to tell. Even even when you have some of the small drop offs, I mean, it's really an increase in the denominator, right? And and you know, of a small subset. And so, when you're looking at at some of this at, at the at the demographic data, it's it's. It's pretty solid, and 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 I don't think, and I think there's a, a good story for us to be able to share, and I do think that 
we do need to promote this and and truthfully promote this um because it's i mean because this is there's a lot of good success stories out there along with again you know from what what you shared earlier in the school year Ms. Baca, with regards to the schools where our students matriculated to, and we need to make sure that that's available since, again, parents always look at that data. Yes, we will have that information in a few weeks. And then the other thing on the recommendations, I think these recommendations are all great. Uh, and the presentation was really helpful. Thank you for getting all that information together. It was nice to be able to go through all that and um, kind of have it as a foundation for future thinking because um, we never really broke things down this way before. You know, so it's starting that work of getting it really a deep dive into data is great. Plus, you know, I, I nerd out on it. So thank you so much for. <laughs> yes, thank you. Anything else from anyone? Nope. Okay, moving on to the budget update. Ms. Van Rappos. Thank you, President Salahuddin. Good evening, everyone. I am um, going to try to be quick, but I did want to give you information um, about the budget since it's been updated with the May revise. Um, I think it's important for you to have you know, to have all the information to be well informed because there may be decisions that need to be made uh, in the next year or so that uh, the more information you have, the better prepared you'll be to make those decisions and also to continue the advocacy work that you've done in the past. So I am going to try to go quickly through this because it is already kind of a long meeting and I know that you've all had time to look at this information. So uh, just unmute yourself and jump in if you want me to slow down or if you want to uh, clarify something as I move through and then I'll just uh, leave time at the end for questions. So again, um, this information is based on the May revise. Um, this is just a snapshot of a time in the process. So this is the last set of data points we get before we have to adopt our budget, but things are not gonna stay static. Um, the governor's May revise is just that, it's the governor's perception of what the budget should be. He still needs to work with the legislature and they need to adopt a budget. And then also um, there could be revisions even in August. So. This is just our best information that we have right now, but it will change. So the context I think is really important this year. Um, the COVID-19 situation has dramatically impacted the world. Um, and this is one snapshot of, of what is happening in the US. You can see that just the two weeks of um, quarter one for 2020 shows that we already had a big impact just from those two weeks in that quarter. And then it looks like this entire quarter is going to be um, under COVID-19 situation. So the impact to the GDP is, is dr very dramatic. And that of course impacts uh, the income for the state. So what the Legislative Analyst Office, that's what the LAO is, they uh, analyze and predict. And they are making predictions based on either a U-shaped recovery, which means that we had a, a steep drop, we'll go along low for just a short period of time, and then we will get back uh, to recovering, or an L-shaped recovery, which is the worst case scenario where we had the steep drop and we just stay at the bottom, along the bottom of the L. And so that's what these um, graphs show is that even in the best case scenario, which is the uh, gray bars here, it's still gonna be less than what we had anticipated when we were talking about this in January. And just because I think it's important that you understand that the rainy day fund is not gonna save everything. It's nice that we have it. It was a good investment um, for our state to, to invest in this rating day fund, but it's it's 
only going to make a small dent in uh, the dramatic decrease we've had in revenues. So then when we look a little bit closer at um, the education impact, Prop 98 is the state guarantee to K-14 education. Um, we are under test one, which is, means that we just get a straight percentage, we being K-14 education, a straight percentage of the state revenue. It's about 38%. Um, and historically, the legislature hasn't gone above this minimum that they're required to give to school districts. And you can see that this is coming in less than was anticipated. So this impacts um, everything, but it, it most dramatically impacts the LCFF formula. And even though we aren't uh, funded under this formula anymore, I think it's important for us to understand um, the formula and how it impacts all of education. This gives a historical perspective of how the LCFF funding has changed over time. So these are not uh, raw numbers, but actually how much it has increased. So the change each year. So you can see that the change in um, 2018-19 was greater than the change in 2017-18. And this year, 19-20 uh, that we're currently in, all of the increase came from the COLA, the cost of living um, increase. And because the purple part was when we were in imp implementation of LCFF, they gave us a little boost every year to try and get closer to that target. We're done getting to the target, and so we only get COLA. There is a statutory COLA for this coming year for 2021 of 2.31%. And um, then after that COLA is implemented, so that's the striped area, after that COLA is implemented, there will be a 10% reduction for the shortfalls in the budget from COVID-19. And so the net reduction for LCFF funding is 7.92%. The governor has said in his May revise that if federal relief funds come through, that we could trigger off that 10% reduction. So they're showing everything in terms of um, if we get the 2.31% COLA, the new grant, uh, base grant for 912 will be $9,544. But if we don't get additional funds from the federal government and we have to do the 10% reduction, the base grant for nine through 12 will be $8,590 per student. And um, I always like to pay attention what school services puts out uh, information about the purchasing power of the LCFF formula because there's a lot of talk that we're back to where we were in 07, 08. And it's, the truth is we never have gotten back there. Um, when we've gotten increases in funding, it's always come with increased demand for things that we need to pay for. And so the purchasing power of the federal fund, or I mean, sorry, the state funding to schools has not ever gotten back to that 0708 level. And you can see that this year, the 2021, it is projected to get further away from that purchasing power. So if we were an LCFF funded district for 2021, um, we would get that $8,590 per student in the base. And we would also get another 20% for each student that is in the supplemental funded unduplicated count. So overall, we would get about $38.3 million, which comes out to $9,247 per student. If we were LCFF, then this basic aid pot are monies that we would not get. They would be part of the LCFF formula. So that's what um, I used to make the comparison of how are we doing with our funding compared. So the state aid, the Redevelopment Act funds, the Educational Protection Act funds, and our property taxes, those three are all wrapped up in the formula. So when those three fall below what the state formula comes up with, that's when we fall into LCFF and it all just becomes part of that formula. So next year we're projected to be above that, which means that we will receive um, in that same pot of money about $11,975 per ADA per our um, student. And even if the 
trigger for the 10% uh, reduction in LCFF funding is removed, we will still be over the amount. If that happened, we, it would be closer, it would be around $10,200 per student, which is still under. So we will remain basic aid for 2021. So uh, there's a lot more money that we get besides, um, well, not a lot more, <laughs> but there are other pots of money that we get besides uh, the, the amount that I just spoke about. From the state, we get special education money, we get mandated block grant, we get lottery, our minimum state aid, and um, we get grant money. And so compared to last year, or compared to this year, compared to 1920, all of those funds will either not see the COLA so that is, um, it will, whoops, sorry. Lost my cursor for a second. Okay. So uh, none of them will be receiving the COLA and some of them are receiving an additional deduction, uh, especially our CTE and Strong Wars Workforce Grants, which um, are also for CTE programs. Um, the other thing is that the chartered school in our district gets their funding based on the LCFF formula. And so with the 10% reduction in LCFF, um, it means that's less that we need to pass along to them from our funding. And so with that reduction, we have about $340,000 that we don't need to pay them. If the reduction gets removed, if there's federal funds to cover that, then we will need to pay them that amount. That's just something to keep an eye on. All right, so on to what potential relief um, is available. So already through the CARES Act, the federal government has provided some relief to California. Um, California received about $2 billion specific for K-12 education. 90% uh, of the 1.65 billion had to go directly to schools through their Title I allocation. So for that, we're scheduled to get about $350,000 in July. That's when they're telling it'll probably arrive as in July. The state has two other pots that they can set aside in 10% um, of the 1.65 billion they set aside for state level activities. And then there's 355 million in a governor's emergency relief fund that has to go to education. And he hasn't told us exactly what, well, on the next slide, you see that he has talked about what he's planning to do with that. So on the left side of this chart is those, those gear funds. Uh, what he has proposed in the May revise is that this would be allocated to schools based on their special education enrollment. Um, that is something that the state of California has typically shied away from. Uh, the legislature doesn't like to allocate funds based on special education enrollment because they don't want to incentivize um, qualifying students for special education. And so this has been already hotly contested. So I don't know if this allocation method will, will stand up. If it does stand up, um, we would see about $800,000 of relief funds in this area. The other um, fund that's available on the right side of the screen is the 4 billion, or there was 9.5 billion um, in a COVID relief fund. 4 billion of that, the governor has proposed go to education. And as May revised, he said he wants 4 billion of it to go to ed education. But um, he is recommending that it only be allocated to school districts that have con concentration grant funds. So that have either 55% or more uh, students in that unduplicated category. So that means that we wouldn't qualify for any of that money if, if this uh, way of allocating the funds stands. But this slide right here is one of the most, according to school services, it's one of the most highly debated parts of the May revise. Another part of the relief that the governor has in the May revise is to provide some non-Prop 98 funds for 
pension relief. So the blue bars show you what the schedule was for the pension programs to increase. So STRS, which is for the uh, certificated folks, was scheduled to increase to 8.4% employer contribution next year. And with the contribution that the governor is proposing in the May revise, we would only need to pay 16.15%. Um, for PERS, uh, it was scheduled to go to 22.8%. And with the May revise, it's scheduled to go to 20.7%. So this is a big investment from uh, the governor into helping schools meet some of our um, demands on, on our funds. And it actually, if this holds, it's, it would be $650,000 that we would not be paying out that we had thought we would need to pay out. So it is a significant relief. And the other thing that he's talking about is to gradually increase the share of the Prop 98 supplemental pin payments, um, which means that rather than 38% of the general fund revenues going to education, he's proposing that by 23, 24, it would be 40% of the revenue go to education. And so this is something that isn't going to impact us next year, but it is something that is uh, on the horizon perhaps for future relief. And, um, you know, in the previous recession, there were a lot of uh, leeway. There was a lot of leeway given to districts about maybe uh, sweeping all their funds and not having to use them for specific purposes, or there was flexibility in the amount of days that we had in the school year and things like that. And those, those tools might not be available to us. And so it's something to be thinking about is because of the loss in learning from the at-home learning situation, legislators are gonna probably be less likely to allow us to use our supplemental funds, for instance, for general purposes or to reduce the number of school days um, to try and meet our financial obligations. So we're gonna to have to become more creative. So the last part here is our multi-year projections. So how did all of this information impact our budget? We talked about our budget about two weeks ago and um, this just solidified a little bit more uh, what we need to do to, to get our budget approved. So um, what I'm recommending is that in 2021, we reduce our materials and supplies and our services and contracts um, to take up the, the to, to get back to what we were spending like two or three years ago and really tighten our belts and make sure that we're being uh, very careful about what we spend. And so I think that's realistic. And I think that if we are able to do that in 2021, it will go a long way to uh, making the impacts less dramatic in the out years. For 21, 22, um, in order to make everything work, we would need to do an additional $500,000 of reduction. And because we've already tightened our belt as much as we can on materials and supplies and services and things like that, it would likely need to come from reductions in staff, cutting hours, cutting positions. And then in 22, 23, another $900,000 um, in that third year of the budget to, to make it so that we can show a positive um, ending fund balance and keep our required reserves. Here are the numbers more specifically. <clears throat> um, as you can see, the, the reserves at the end here dwindle each year so that we still have maintain the 3% reserve that we are required to have by law. The board does not need to decide what cuts happen at this point. Um, they just have to be aware that in order to make the budget work, we have to make these cuts and we have to be able to tell the county that we've had this discussion and the board is aware. We have time to decide if and what would be cut. We don't have to make those decisions tonight. So um, what we talked about in the last board meeting, I think still holds is a recommendation to wait until at least after the August revision maybe until first interim in November, 
But at that point, when we have all of the information, start a budget committee that looks at the whole district, how we're spending all of our money, takes a, an in-depth look, gets stakeholder input, and makes recommendations to the board. Um, I think that is a very good um, course of action. And I think that in our district, we have a lot of people who would be interested in providing that kind of input. So um, the steps that we have to take right now is the, the budget has to go for public review by May 28th. So that's just two days from now. Um, and then we will have a public hearing on June 2nd with the adoption on June 16th. And as Corrine mentioned, the LCAP and budget are not linked anymore. Um, I feel like this is a really responsible budget and it's a uh, good way for us to to try to weather the, the long term by um, doing a little bit each year rather than, you know, if we weren't to make any cuts in 2021, we could keep our 3% uh, reserve for that one year, but then it would mean dramatic cuts in the next two years. And so I think taking it year by year helps us uh, to, to be as responsible as, as possible with our with our public funds. That is the end. Um, I'm trying to, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see if people typed anything. Maybe I can see it without that. There we go. Um, right. So uh, the first question is we get LCFF or basic aid, not both. That's correct. Yeah. LCFF would be if we didn't get enough property taxes, we would fall into that category. Because we receive more property taxes than the LCFF formula, we, uh, we fall into the basic aid category. And then uh, when the housing is built, will that help with income? So not right away. The, the way that we have the housing set up is that we've invested all the money possible in building as many units and making them as nice as we can. Uh, and the financial model is that we use the rent to maintain the building and to pay back the loan that we're taking out to build it. And then once we have enough rental income that we are uh, either done paying off the loan, which is I think 30 years, <laughs> or, um, or if we start generating more income than the loan payments cost, then we can start adding some money to the general fund. But it's not, it was not designed to be a money generator. It was designed to uh, house our, our employees. And also, I mean, you mentioned earlier that we're losing the revenue for the rents possibly soon. So it kind of balances that out a little. I mean, there's gonna be some loss with rent revenue. Yes, So that's true. We will lose the rent rent revenue rental revenue at Ceremony Del Rey. But yes, it's designed to be a break-even program. I know I went fast. I'm sorry for going so fast, but I didn't want to take more time than I needed. Um, you have something, Andy? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, you've done a nice job actually just over the past couple of meetings to be able to explain this to us. And and so this isn't anything new, but this the update with the May revise is helpful. And so, you know, and I think you're just to be commended also just for the work you're doing to keep a close eye on this, keeping us informed so that there aren't any surprises. And, and so I'm just grateful to you for the work you've done to really keep this, keep us, help keep us on track. Thank you. I, it's it's helpful that you guys are so engaged. I, honestly, you know, it's um, it's easy to talk to people about something when they are engaged. So trying, you're making it easier. <laughs> at um, at some point, we would have to be creative, and that we wouldn't be able to use our supplemental funds. Um, do you? That's not our parcel taxes. No, okay. our parcel taxes, we have to use um, in line with the rules that we set for ourselves when we went out for the parcel tax. We said right. it was gonna be used okay. for these things. It has to be used for those things. What I was saying is um, in the last recession, 
we were allowed to take all of our funds, CTE funds, mm -hmm. um, supplemental funds. They weren't called all those things, but okay. and any of our funds and use them for anything. We could use them for anything that we wanted. Any state funds could be used for paying salaries. It could be used for, you know, uh, running the buses. So that's one tool they gave us in the recession that they might not be able to give us in this downturn because of the um, because of the learning loss that students have had that they okay. feel like politically they have to put an emphasis on that which you know politically or not we all need to put an emphasis on mm -hmm. helping the students regain what they've lost and especially our, our least resourced students mm -hmm. and that's what the supplemental funds are designed to meet the needs okay. of our least resourced students. So they probably will not provide us with flexibility for that. Oh, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think that just falls in line with where we all are at a board anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would be interested in using supplemental funds for anything other than what they're supposed to be for, which is helping our least resourced students gain equity, so. Yes, Nick. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It's very in depth and um, for like the kind of global perspective it provides. Um, just to note, um, you know, as board members, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, although you know, we could say this Great Recession has been ongoing the last ten plus years, the different recoveries and ups and downs as a state um, and as a nation um, have varied depending like what communities you know and districts we belong to, but. Um, I mean, my, I speak for myself, and I think as a board, we weren't here for the last recession, the, the biggest drop in budget cuts. And um, having to look at this um, with some perspective helps a lot. So um, thank you for the projections. And um, it takes, I don't want to say it makes the sting, sting any less painful for um, maybe prospective um, educators and, and current staff who are looking at whether or not, you know, they have a two or three year plan um, that they can you know, count on because we've had a teacher shortage and a staff shortage for a while, but now we're looking at something different. So um, it helps to have this in advance. And um, you know, just as somebody who's been mindful of this in my own career, I would just you know, like to say to echo like what you're saying now, we still have more data to look at um, August. You know, and uh, I mean, a lot can happen over this summer. We don't know um, where the state and nation are going, uh, stimulus money, is in the order of trillions in the last few months. And so um, hopefully we won't have to uh, um, take this in, uh, I guess, with the deepest gravity, you know, and then think about what that means um, years out from now, because we have a lot of things going on that are really good and we've done a lot of good work. So um, yeah, I, I think we, we do have uh, to consider a lot and I appreciate the information at this point because um, we're not getting a lot of information otherwise, um, because not everybody knows what's going on at the state and national level. So. Thank you. You know, in terms of the teacher retention problem, I'm just kind of building on what Nick said. In the 2008 recession, there were a lot of teachers who got laid off and never came back to the profession and we never recovered from that. So I think that we need to really keep our focus on what we can do to recruit and retain uh, because that'll happen again. There are many districts already talking about layoffs and quite likely, a lot of those new teachers are never going to come back to the profession. Any other comments or questions? No. Nope. Um, I will just say that uh, the purchasing power slide, I love that slide. I mean, that was a really helpful visual that I think we should use a lot especially in presentations to community um, because there is still like, while they've been very helpful and supportive anytime we go and ask for assistance, I think there is, because they really support education, there still is that underlying, why do they always need help? And so I think this really helps visually demonstrate that, that, you know, especially when legislators, and we've had this conversation with them and we'll continue to have it the way they message it, they continually talk about the money that's being dumped into education. And they're gonna continue to do that through COVID. They're like, we're diverting all these funds into the COVID-19 for schools. So this really helps illustrate, yes, we're getting that money, but it's still not even getting us back to where we were. And it's a nice visual to help with that. 
Um, and again, to both you and Ms. Baca, I mean, and, and to the entire executive cabinet, it has just been phenomenal seeing all the presentations and all the work that you've been doing. And, you know, I'm extremely grateful uh, for everything that you guys have all have done throughout all of this to maintain the high level of output and service um, has been fantastic. So thank you for the presentation, Tina. Um, my other question is Baca was, did you need us to, I totally forgot, did we need to approve the COVID working document? Um, no. Not yet. It will be approved with the budget. With the budget. On okay. June 16th. Got it. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And um, with that, unless there's anything else, I'll move on to future agenda items. Awesome. Okay, moving on to adjournment. We are not adjourning in memory of anyone this time. So unless anyone has anything else, if I get a move motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. You guys are always in the race. You guys are always in the race. Second. <laughs> all those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Um, and I know I don't think we're we're not gonna be meeting again until after school year ends, correct, as a board. So I do also wanna say thank you to all of our teachers and all of our staff for all the incredible work they have done this year. I mean, I was always so proud to be a member of JUHSD and in the past couple of months have just really highlighted why I am so proud to be a part of this district and talk about this district everywhere I go and really highlight and make sure that our district is highlighted in the way it needs to be highlighted in my advocacy role as a board member because this is who we are and you know and emergencies really demonstrate who we really are and I think that you know really it just over and over and over again, just repeatedly with through volunteering and all the extra work and even being at the professional development, I was so thankful that Terry invited me to come and just seeing everybody showed up to that professional development right at the beginning and really just no complaints, nothing just got to work. And that was a huge ask and everyone just stepped up. So I'm hugely grateful to every teacher, every staff member in the JUHSD for getting us through this school year. Thank you all so much. Hi everyone, sorry. Um, hey Candice. <laughs> don't forget May 29th, the end of the year celebration. Um, and Tony stated that um, the link will uh, be coming to you soon. And don't forget June 2nd, we do have a regular board meeting. And we also have one June 16th and June 30th, a special meeting. Got it, thank you so much. Yes, Ms. Presta. I realized I was typing it in the box, but I don't think people were seeing it. We're going to put a link on our website so that people can access that really easily, but that won't go on until it it's until we've got it, until it's all done. <laughs> so probably tomorrow or Thursday. Got it. Great. Thank you. Okay. So with that, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>